Good morning. There's a little buzz in the air today. Everybody seems real happy to be here. It's good. It's a great place to be. Uh, you know, there are uh, many transitions in life. Have anybody ever experienced a transition in life before? Uh, transitions. There was a, oh, oh, yes. Someone going through a midlife crisis, maybe. Or <laughs> anyway, um, there are many transitions in life, and some, some are more important than others. Some are more layered than others. But what I find is that how we respond to transitions will determine out, uh, long-term outcome. How we respond in the midst of when something is changing. You know, I've watched my kids transition from babies to toddlers, school age, and now a couple of them uh, adolescents. And there will be a time when they transition into adults. Now, certain things have been established for them. Certain truths have been established for them. A foundation has been given to them. But they will have to decide what to do with what's been given. So today, I want to talk about a transition in the Bible that really shaped a generation, and it shaped a kingdom. A transition that shaped a generation, and it shaped a kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray today uh, for your anointing. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit uh, would speak through me today, uh, that your people would hear the word of God, that it would not only challenge them, but it would, it would change them. It would change us. Uh, and God, I pray today that, um, that you would speak, that we would hear your voice loud and clear, and that uh, something would take place today that would truly change our hearts and our minds in a powerful way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, King David, he'd accomplished a lot in his life. I think that's, that's an understatement. Uh, he conquered lands, he built a kingdom, and was leaving a legacy to the next generation, specifically uh, one of his sons, Solomon. Uh, this was David's son. He was appointed to take over uh, the kingdom, and he did so in impressive fashion. Uh, we're not going to be able to cover all of the, the details and the layers of Solomon's life, but, but Solomon was, was a pretty big deal. Um, David, where David was a, a brave man of war who, who conquered many lands while staying uh, surrendered to God, Solomon was a brilliant builder with wisdom that was unmatched. The Bible actually said there was no one like Solomon. His, his wisdom was unmatched in all the land. Yet Solomon also at times had a tendency to, to sway and stray from God. Uh, Solomon had amazing qualities to carry out being a great king. Like he was and would have been a, a great king. His mind uh, was brilliant. He knew how to handle situations. Uh, he was not just a good steward of things, but he was truly a good leader, and he could see things that others could not see. Uh, David set Solomon up for generational success. I mean, I'm not just talking about a little bit of success. David set his son Solomon up for generational success. Uh, and the Bible actually talks about this in 1 Kings uh, chapter 2, verses 1 th through 4. That's where we're going to be first today. If you're turning there, great. If not, it is on the screen. I do encourage you. Uh, bring your Bibles. It's a good way to learn where stuff is in the Bible, and we can follow along together. But this is going to be 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. If you're ready, say amen. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to his son Solomon. I am about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Now, now look at this statement. Do this so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you go and, the, and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. If, if your descendants watch how they live and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. That's a pretty big statement. That's a pretty big promise. And, and what this scripture outlines, and you see this a lot in the Bible, and we, we need to understand it because it's a pretty big principle in the Bible. It's the if-then principle. Yeah. 
if, if you do this, then this will happen. And I use this, really at the time, I think unknowingly with my kids. We do it all the time with our kids. And I, and I tell my kids this, look, if you do everything I say, life will be good. <laughs> I, I'm just letting you guys know, like, if you just do what I say, you're probably going to get more, have more benefits, and you won't get beat. Okay, it's really simple. Like, it's a really simple concept. If you do this, or if you don't do this, then everything will go well for you. How many know what I'm saying? Right, and I think this is a great parenting tip, by the way, the if-then principle. Just do that, and, and I think it'll help your parenting out a lot. Now, as we know, uh, not just kids, but ourselves, we don't always follow the if-then principle. And when we don't follow the if-then principles, there are consequences, right? Now, when we look at Solomon's life, he is in a situation, really, it's, it's the best possible situation that he could be in. Like, Solomon is set up for success. His father was King David. His father was a skilled musician. His father loved the Lord. His father did everything that he could to build a solid foundation, not only for uh, Solomon's life, but for the kingdom of God. His father gave him every opportunity to succeed. And this is the first point that I want to bring today is that Solomon was firmly established. Solomon was firmly established in his life. He was established and now coming into the kingdom to lead. Yes, he might have felt overwhelmed. Yes, he might not have felt up for the task. But if anybody had a firm foundation to stand on, it was Solomon. Now he is the new king. He was given a foundation stable enough for a kingdom to stand and for generations to follow. God's word tells us that, hey, if you do these things, and it's not a big list, it's a short list, then you will never not have someone on the throne. Like, there will always be someone in your line that sits on the throne if you just do these few things. But here was the problem, and it didn't seem like a big problem at the time, which we're going to learn about um, but it became a, a pretty big issue, and that is that Solomon had exceptions. He, he, he made exceptions in his life for certain things. And that's what I want to talk about today is just that word exceptions. Because when you read this story, there's, there's nothing that really stands out to me in a big way, in big detail, that, you know, Solomon did this, and he, he made this, this massive exception in his life. No, he just began to make really small exceptions in his life. The kingdom was established in Solomon's hands, but he began to make exceptions in his heart. And this is what I find, is that we always start to make exceptions in our, in our heart first, in our mind first, before we really act on them. You with me? They, they always start inward, whether it's our mind, whether it's our heart. These exceptions, they start small. Maybe we begin to develop them internally, and then the exceptions make their way to the external. Let's check this out. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because a temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father, David. Good job. This is what was told of you to do. Do this and all will go well. Everything will be good. The kingdom will be established, except, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. Uh, I, I would encourage you to, to do some reading and study on that uh, yourself. But these high places were, were set up uh, for pagan worship. And a, a lot of people, not just, not just pagans, but even uh, the people of God at times have worship on these, these high 
places, and we may not fully understand it culturally, uh, but know this, that we, we have the same situation that happens today. It might look a little different, but it's the same, it's the same deal. Um, we, we love the Lord, we worship the Lord, but also at times there's some other stuff that we tend to worship as well, and there's some other stuff that we put up on, on the high place instead of God. Are you with me? We see this in our culture, we see this in society, so it's like, we'll, we'll read this and we'll be like, oh, no way, like, that, that's not happening. Trust me, it's, it's happened throughout history. <laughs> and, and people will worship the Lord, yet they'll also worship some other things as well. Now, this is what Solomon did. This is what Solomon did. He went to the high places and he would, he would worship. He would be a part, listen, this is what he did. He would just be a part of the culture. And, and it all started, really, for him with an alliance that he made. An alliance. Our alliances and our exceptions will go hand in hand. Our, our alliances and our exceptions will go hand in hand. If you read uh, what we, we just went over there, it talked about how he made an alliance with who? The, the king, the pharaoh, or, or sorry, the king of Egypt. Are you with me? Up until this point, right? So he made, he made this alliance, and he married Pharaoh's daughter. Now, we must understand something, that God's instruction not to intermarry with other lands was, was nothing to do with skin color. It had nothing to do with, with social class. It had nothing to do with economics. It had everything to do with idol worship and false gods. Okay, please hear this. Like if anybody's teaching anything other than that, it's false. Don't listen to that garbage. Are you with me? So the reason God said, look, you need to not intermarry with some of these lands is because there was, there was idol worship. And what, what does Solomon do? Solomon says, I'm going to make this alliance. I'm going to marry his daughter. And now what happens? He makes an alliance and he begins to make exceptions in his life. We're just going to go hang out at the high places. That's what my wife does. That's what I'm going to do. We're just going to go. We're going to be a part of the culture. We're just going to do what they do a little bit because, you know, that's, that's what everybody's doing. It seems like an all right thing to do. We can justify this somehow, some way. And our alliance will go hand in hand with the exception. The exception that Solomon made would affect so much more than he realized. So much more. Like Solomon didn't think for a second, like, hey, this is going to be a big deal. This is going to affect the kingdom. And I'm not trying to be overly dramatic this morning at all. I, I'm a bit wrestling with, with even this message because, you know, you want it to come across in a way where you're not seeming like absolutely insane, but also just insane enough for the Lord, if that makes sense. I hope it does. Because it's so easy for any one of us to get caught up with the wrong alliance that will, that will begin to bring in exceptions in our life that we would not have thought of before. And specifically, exceptions with whether it be God's word or worship or whatever it might be. Um, here's the deal. Exceptions can weaken foundation. Exceptions can weaken foundation. I mean, I could, I could tell you story after story today, and I, I, will, I will spare you the agony of it, of this situation that I've seen in people's life. I've seen this over and over again. If you don't care, bring that up again just one more time. I didn't know I was going to ride that long here, but I want to just... I want to leave that there for a second. I've seen this over and over again in people's lives. That you make exceptions, and what does it do? It begins to weaken, and I would even use the word erode, the foundation of someone's life. I have, I have stories of people that I went to Bible college with, of people that I listened to who were some of the greatest preachers I'd ever heard as young men and women of God. I, I've, I've heard, uh, uh, or I've saw people that their life was stable, it was firm. It was established. They were, they were loving God. They were loving people. They were doing all these things. And something somewhere, I, I can't lay my finger on it, 
but I've noticed it at times in people's lives when it's like, wow, there's something different. There's different in a good way and there's different in a bad way, right? Like there's just something going on. Now, I don't know a person's life, but I would, I would probably say that it's something to do with an alliance. It's something to do with a connection. I mean, I can't tell you the people I've heard over the years say, I read this book. You know, I read this book. Well, if you're getting all weird and googly-eyed over a book that's not the Bible, I'm going to say there's probably an issue. I'm just, I'm just letting you know. Well, I read this book, man, and it's just got me thinking. What, all kind of crazy stuff that no one's ever heard before? If, if, if that's the case, I, I throw the flag. Are you with me? I'm, this is just, I, I pray this is just good sound teaching for us because we need to know that if something is so revolutionary and no one's ever heard it before and it's, and it's drifting us away from the church in the name of the Lord, in the name of God, I, I'm telling you, throw the flag on it. Throw the flag on it because there's something up with that. Well, just, you know, I'm just not sure this is what God intended. Oh, you, okay, let's sit and have a conversation. How, you tell me what you think God intends for all of humanity. God's word is the clearest thing that we can read in regards to how we model our life, how, 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 we, how we live our day-to-day -day lives, how we worship, where we worship. And this is not a debate about, you know, people want to do this throughout time too, like, is it about big church, small church, mega church, house church? I don't care what church, but a church. The church is the church. And people try to say, well, you know, uh, we're the church. Great. That's nothing new. We know this. We are the church, but the church gathers in a place. So if that's 10 people in a house, great. If that's 1,000 people under a roof outside somewhere in another country, great. If it's 10,000 in a building, great. I don't really care and I'm not going to write a book about it. Okay, because the deal is that the church gathers. Right, the church meets. And we just came through a season where what, what happened? The church was disrupted. The church was broke apart. The church was scattered. And now you're seeing people realize, wow, the church is kind of a big deal. Because if not, then you start making these alliances and these exceptions and things. Well, I'm just doing my own thing. That never works out well for anybody spiritually. I mean, you get caught up in all kind of craziness. Before you know it, you're worshiping at high places. Solomon made these exceptions that it weakened the foundation. If you know anything about Solomon, you know that, uh, not his woman, but his women... Uh, caused him to allow exceptions, which that's a whole conversation I'm going to have with God later. Like 700 wives? This dude might have had some issues. <laughs> uh, and and I, if I'm not mistaken, it's something like 300 concubines. Interesting choice. Sounds like a great time, 700 wives. No, doesn't sound like a great time. Love you, babe. Just need one, just you. Just you. But I thought it was a good time to get and just put, put that in there. I wouldn't say, yeah, anyway. So <laughs> Solomon's women began to draw him away. If you read the Bible, the story tells us how his heart was gravitating toward what they wanted, what they desired, because what do we want to do? We, we kind of want to please our wife. So, you know, 700 of them he had. And so this was a lot of different alliances he's making and it begins to erode the foundation of his life. We must be sure we do not allow exceptions to erode our foundation. And if I could just speak specifically in the here and now, this is happening everywhere, that the foundation of our life, the foundation of truth and Christianity and morality the fabric of all those things is being pulled. The foundation of all those things right now is being rained down upon 
in such a way where if we're not firmly established, it will be easy to just slip right off the edge of the foundation. Why? Because it's begin to crumble. Solomon made exceptions that would eventually affect the kingdom. Hear this. Because God's word, it, it's, it's for us. Okay, it's, it's to direct us. These are truths that are, are as true now as they were then. Solomon made exceptions that eventually affected the kingdom and the next generation. The kingdom of God and the next generation. I'll, I'll be as bold to say that the church and God's people at all times, not just at this point, but at all times are a generation away from dying off or two. I'm telling you. And if you track back to different countries and um, different lands, nations, you'll see that this can happen. I've, I've seen pictures from other nations before that were thriving, and you know, whether it be in the, the 40s and 50s, and now you see this nation and it's totally destroyed, it's dilapidated. What happens? What happens in a generation? What happens with, with literally one person to the next? The foundation is eroded. The foundation begins to crumble for whatever reason. And it affects the kingdom and it affects the next generation. And can I tell you that so can we. So can we. Again, I, this, is, this is coming off a little more intense than I anticipated. Um, but I think we need to understand how important it is. What we believe. Why we believe it. What is the foundation of our life? And, and, and our life cannot be set up upon one message we heard on Instagram and a, and a, and a new hot song. Like our, our theology, like our, our doctrine, the way we live, it can't be set up like that. Because that stuff will, will shift here and there and everywhere. We need to understand that the church is not a style. It's not. It's going to change. If you stick around here for long enough, the style is going to change. The songs are going to change. The atmosphere might change a little bit. But, but what is it that we are standing upon? What is it that leads, guides, and directs our life? So I'll be as bold to say, yeah, we can affect this generation and the one to come. Every single one of us. Yes, how we live, what we believe, what we teach, and, and the exceptions that we make, it's, it's that big of a deal. It's that big of a deal because we're, we're raising up and we're training up the next generation. I mean, we could go all into the issues that are within schools and the lack of uh, parents and the lack of interaction. You know, I... There's all kinds of school teachers and principals in here. I'm sure you all could have stories for days about the stuff you guys see. Where does that start? It, it, it starts here and now, but it started a generation ago. Why, why are we seeing some of the things we're seeing? And if, and if you keep letting it go in that direction, if people, individuals, keep letting it go in that direction, the wheels really come off. And now let's, let's take that to our faith now. Let's take that to what we believe. Let's take that to the Bible. And man, the wheels can really come off. The wheels can really come off. What we believe about the Bible is important. And I'm just going to say this because I think it's important just for you to know a little bit of you know, context or background from where I'm coming from with this, with this statement there was a time when, like, I was, I was totally frustrated with tradition and um, whether it be, you know, church tradition or the way the church did things. And, like, I, at one point in time, I had kind of a, like a, I guess, a bad taste in my mouth about the church. Not, not any specific church, just in general. And that's why it's like, we're going to do stuff different. We don't have to do it the same and all this kind of stuff. And now, as I'm, as I'm getting older, I'm, I'm seeing, like, 
yeah, we're going to do stuff different. We're not going to do it the same as everybody else, but there is value in tradition. And there, there is value in, hey, the historical church has done this for a thousand years. It's pretty important. Hey, the historical church has believed this for thousands of years. This is pretty important. Are you with me? So, and that's what I say, the church has nothing to do with style. Like, a style is a style. It'll come and go. But what are the foundational truths? Like, what we believe about sound doctrine and foundational teaching is important. That is why church attendance and raising our kids in God's house, it matters. And please, can I tell you that it's not because I want to see a full room on Sunday. I preached through COVID. I, I saw one person on Sundays for a long time. I mean, it was crappy, but I still did it. It doesn't matter if the room's full or if there's a few people scattered throughout. God's word is still the same, but it matters if his, if his house is filled. Why? Because that represents something. So it's not just a number. It's not just so we can say, hey, we had a bunch of people here on this day or that day or on Easter or whatever. It's like, no, I'm not, as, I'm not near as concerned about Easter numbers and Christmas numbers. I want to know, hey, are people here? Like, are they really here? Are they establishing God's house? Why? Because that represents the next generation and the generation to come after that. It's important. So I, I, I love the, the opportunity that, you know, virtual gives us when we can, we're out, we're away, and we can get online and watch a service. That's incredible. Do that. It's summertime. People are going to be out, vacations, whatever you got going on. Do that, but please don't forget the importance of gathering together in his house. It is, a, it is a foundation. It's a foundation. We always face transitions in life. We, we always will. And I, re I really do believe this. You don't have to believe this. You can look around and gain your own um, opinion on this matter. This is my opinion on the matter. I want to be clear. This is my personal opinion on the matter, that the church at large is at a serious transition point. Um, and, it, and it happens so quickly. It happens so fast. And you're in a transition before you even realize you're in a transition. And here's what I find about transitions. When you don't know the decision you're going to make, when you're in the transition, you sometimes make the wrong one. And so it's, it's good to have a foundation of what we stand upon, what we, what we believe. What we believe, you know, what we, what we stand for. Because truth will be challenged. And truth is being challenged now more than ever, I'll say that. Again, it's because I live now. You know, I say that a lot. I've noticed that. Now more than ever. What's well, because you're alive, dummy? You know, like, I get that. <laughs> I understand why I say that, because I'm living here and now. But, but truth is being challenged, and how the church responds will determine the outcome. Like, I think about this often, and, and not, in a, not in a weird, like, down way, or downer way, but, but, but I think about, could this church be another place that was once filled, and, you know, when I'm, when I'm old and gray, it has just a tens instead of hundreds? Could it be? Like, it certainly could. Could this church be a place there where people drive by? They say, man, once upon a time, that place was bumping. Like, there was all kind of people. You should have saw that place, two services, and they were parking cars all over the place. It was crazy, and now they're down to one, and there's just a handful of people in that building. I've heard that before about churches. Man, you know, there's just a handful of people that go there. Anybody ever heard that before? There's just a handful of people. Well, yeah, that, that's a possibility. That is a possibility, but I want to be a part of the people where they say, man, you know what, that started 50 years ago, and man, it's just as vibrant now as ever, and there's, there's young, there's old, there's middle-aged, there's kids. They got programs there for, for young people, and, and their student ministry's thriving. I, I, want, I want to hear that in 50 years. Because that's what faith is about, is not just the flash in the pan, but it's about the longevity of a foundation in people's lives so we can literally build our life upon it. Like what we're preaching here, what we're doing, I'm telling you, it matters. 
it matters. When we come and we set, we're not, just, we're not just coming to hear something inspirational. I hope at times you're inspired, but we're coming to, to, to give ourselves more foundation that when the winds of life and change and everything else blow against us, we have something solid to stand on. That we have something stable. And that when, when death comes in our family, we have something stable to, 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 to rest upon. That when tragedy happens, we have something stable to stand upon. That when crazy stuff happens and the world's going all nuts, man, people can look at our lives and say, wow, they're not that effective. Why? Because there's a foundation they can stand upon. When all the world is, is seemingly going to hell in a handbasket and we're over here like, hey, it's like a beach. There's something to that. There's something about that. And I think that is the defining factor of the church throughout history is that when everything's going crazy, there's something solid about God's people. There's something solid about it. When everybody else doesn't know what they believe, man, they, they really know what they believe. When nobody knows what they really stand for, man, they, they really stand for something. May that be a, a defining quality of God's people. Don't make exceptions that will weaken the foundation of your life and the generations to come. It's not just about your life and that's where I think people miss it. They just think it's about them. Oh, it's your life, live it. No, you're attached to someone else. Amen. The decisions you make affect someone else. It affects the people coming behind you. Let's be stable. Stable in our beliefs. Cole, you can get him. come on up. Let's be stable in our beliefs. Press into it. Dig into it. Look for more. Look for more than just daily inspiration from God's word. You need that. It's great. And, and listen, the world is not lacking inspiration. Can I just tell you, the world is not lacking being told you're enough, okay? The world is not lacking that. But you know what the world's lacking? Right there. Solid foundation. I was actually told when they built this, you could drive a Mack truck on that. It's solid. Through and through, I think it's on 12-inch centers. Big old, big old boards. We need a foundation to build upon. The world does not lack good, nice things to be said about ourselves. It doesn't lack that at all. You can go to Instagram and, and whatever else, and you can watch reels and what, the short stories all day long of, of everybody telling you how amazing you are just the way you are. That's great. You need a foundation. You need a foundation. A foundation that when you don't care how much you are, how not enough you are, when, when things are coming in your life and you don't know what to do, have something stable to stand upon that doesn't always look pretty. That's the thing about foundations. People don't drive by foundations and say, man, that's a good, that's a sharp foundation. I mean, some of you builders, you do that. Man, that's a good looking foundation. I like that stone or whatever it is. Most people don't drive by houses and say, wow, that is solid. But that's what the house is built on. That's, that's what the house is built on. Our life as believers in Jesus Christ is built upon his word. So let us hold to sound reasoning and doctrine. Let us build our life upon truth and not make exceptions according to culture or the opinion of man. The kingdom and the next generation is counting on us. Am I saying that for effect? You better believe it. You better believe it because I, I believe that is true. That the next generation is counting on us. On what we do in transitions. On how we live our life. On what we're building our life upon. Now, just like Solomon, Everybody will have an opportunity to choose what they want to do in that time and moment, right? You can follow the Lord or you cannot. You can, you can build your life upon that foundation or you can start your own foundation that you think is better, what, whatever you want to do. But may we do all that we can to give a solid foundation for the generations to come because what we do matters. What we do matters. We're gonna pray in just a second, but I, I was, this, this sounds a bit um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Not brash, arrogant. It, it kind of sounds arrogant, I guess. And now I'm questioning why I should share it. <laughs> but just to give you something personal, I don't want you to think less of me. Well, you probably should. So I'll, I'll, I'll share this. Uh, we were talking this week, Holly and I, in the living room and talking about kids and just culture and all this stuff. And people were talking about indoctrinating kids with Christianity and stuff. And I thought to myself, yeah, we, we absolutely are indoctrinating our children with Christianity because it's the only thing stable. I said, yeah, yeah, I, I want my kids to be absolutely out of control in their head because they don't know what they believe. I don't want that. And any good parent would not want that for their children either. For them to figure it out on their own, you're gonna let them figure it out on their own? No, if there's, a, if there's a flat head or a Phillips head, I tell my kids, this is a flat head, this is a Phillips head. Next time I ask for a flat head, bring me a flat head. Are you with me? It's a screwdriver for those who don't. <laughs> Maybe no one told you, I'm just, do you understand what I'm saying? My, my, I, I seem to always have sewer problems, not really sure why, I had some sewer issues this week. Dug up the sewer line, pulled it all out. I just left it, that's the way it's gonna ride, I'm just telling you. Um, I said, I said, hey, go and get me a Matic. I was talking to River, okay? He's six. I said, go get me a Matic. What's that? I said, it's the thing that's got this thing on the end. Like you swing it, right? You swing it. It's got this and it's got the spike on the other end. Go look for the building. Okay. He comes back with this, this like little mini ax thing. This it? It's like, I didn't tell him that's exactly what I need. I said, that's, hey, that's a good call. You're close, but let me show you what a Matic is. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, we're gonna have moments of teaching and moments where people miss it, and that's okay. But no, okay, let me, let me show you what this really is because there is a definition to this mattock. It actually looks like something. It's not a unicorn or whatever you wanna make it. It's a mattock, okay? So next time, he'll know, hopefully, grab me the mattock. Am I making sense? Let's give the next generation something stable to stand upon so that when the craziness of the world's happening, man, we can stand firm, stable and strong, and the world, the world will now look back at the church and say, my goodness, they're stable. They believe in something. I don't know if I believe in what they believe in, but they believe in something, and it makes me curious about what they believe. Amen? Let's stand to our feet this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word, for your word that keeps us. That when everything's coming against it, it stands. And throughout the generations, people have tried to get rid of the word of God, and it still remains. It still remains. I pray today, God, that you would raise us up strengthen us, be the stability of our life. Yes, Lord, you, you heal the broken. Yes, Lord, you fix things that are wrong. Yes, Lord, you, you, you mend fragile people, but God, something else you do is you make the stable more stable and you make the firm more firm. And God, today I pray that not only would you heal the broken and the hurting, but today you would strengthen the stable, that roots would grow deeper, God, in your word, in your truth, in your spirit, in your presence. May we be people of the word of God. May we be people of worship. May we be people that gather. May we be people that sing. May we be people that lift our hands. May we be people that when all the world says, this is truth, that we stand upon what is true, the word of God. Strengthen us, Lord, as your people. We are not better in any way than others, but we know that it is by your grace in which we stand. We know this, Lord. May we never be arrogant or haughty or 
conceited. But God, may we stand. And sometimes when we stand, it may, it may seem like some of those things. But Lord, help us to always keep a right heart and the right motives, the right mindset as we look toward the world, as frustrating as it is at times. God, help us to love as you have loved, to be stable as you were stable, and to live lives of truth. If you're here today, you don't know Jesus, just know this, he loves you so much. He died on a cross for you and he rose again from the grave. If you haven't put your trust in him, I, I urge you to do so. He will be the stability of your life. And in this moment, you can simply say, Lord, I surrender to you. I give my life to you. Have your way with who I am. I repent of my sins and I turn to you. You're the way, you're the truth, you're the life. And Lord, I pray also that you would strengthen the church, strengthen your people to live for you. And I pray that the world would turn and say, there's something about that life, something about that person that I desire and that I want. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.